This is the Lumix BGH-1. This is the Panasonic Micro Four Thirds box camera, and it is probably my favorite Lumix camera. In fact, I, I, I own five of these. It's kind of ridiculous, and I will do a video on this soon explaining exactly why I have five of these. And I'll show you how they're all set up, because it's actually really, really cool. But while this is the BGH-1, this, this is BS. This is the Lumix BS. It even says it on the box, see? BS. Oh. Oh. This is the Lumix S1H. And this is the BS1H. They took this and put it in this little box. Let's get into it. This is a remarkable camera. This is a Lumix S1H crammed into a box the size of the BGH-1. And when I say the size, I mean the size. It is the exact same width, the exact same height, and only 0.8 millimeters deeper. It is, for all intents and purposes, the same size. In fact, it'll even fit in the existing small rig cage. Now, there are other cages on the market. The BS1H may or may not fit into those, but I can tell you that the small rig cage totally works. So let's take a look at the body, and then we're going to run through the specs. Starting at the top, you'll see it looks virtually identical. We have three quarter 20 screws, the command dial, the start stop recording button, a delete slash return button, your hot shoe port, and then the FN1, the Q menu, and the play button. On the left-hand side, virtually identical, three-quarter 20 ports, the remote port, the SD card door for two SD card slots, and the DC in power port. On the right side, another three-quarter 20s. On the bottom, two-quarter 20s as well. So, so far, all the same. And on the back, once again, you'll find all the same ports. I'll open up some doors on the BS1H. There's your microphone and headphone port the Ethernet port, which is what makes this camera so incredibly cool, in my opinion. On this side, you've got your SDI out, your time code in and out, and GenLock in. Now, if you're not familiar with GenLock, the idea here is that if you have synchronized time code, then all of your shots all have the identical time code. But time code doesn't necessarily mean that the frame starts and stops recording at the exact same time meaning that while it starts at roughly the same time, if you have one frame of video and another frame of video, they may start a little bit off of each other. That normally doesn't matter for normal conventional use. It's fine. But if you need them to start at the precise same time, that's what GenLock's for. Then you also have the USB-C port and an HDMI port. Finally, let's take a look at the front, because this is where we're going to see the only noticeable differences. First of all, of course, the lens mount is going to be a different size. The lens releases are in different places, standard Micro Four Thirds over here, and on the S1H for L-mount, it's over here. Then you'll notice that the three programmable buttons on the BGH-1, here, here, and here, are in different positions on the BS1H. And there's actually more of them. There's now four of these, all on the left-hand side. I do like this layout. It means that if you're shooting handheld, that all four of those buttons are in reach of one hand. It's kind of nice. You'll also see a new lock function here. This allows you to lock all of these buttons, and you can control exactly what locks in software. That's essentially it. Again, they are virtually identical in every way, shape, and form on the outside. Of course, it's what's on the inside that really counts, so let's have a look at the specs and see how they compare. We're going to compare not just the BS1H to the BGH1, but also to the original S1H. So we're going to see how these three compare side by side. We'll start off with the obvious one, the image sensor. Of course, the S1H and the BS1H are full frame, so those are the full frame 24 megapixel sensors, the same sensors in both cameras. Then on the BGH1, it is, of course, a Micro Four Thirds 10 megapixel sensor. If that seems like a low resolution sensor, remember that the BGH1 shares the same sensor as the Lumix GH5S. That lower resolution sensor makes for larger photo sites, which makes for better low light performance. It also means that it is dual native ISO, which we'll find is the same on all of these cameras. 
In-body stabilization is only going to be on the S1H. The box cameras don't have built-in stabilization. And this is, of course, by design. A camera like this is typically mounted on something like a drone or a gimbal. And in that case, the stabilization is in that hardware. Just like the GH5S, there are situations and cameras where you really don't want stabilization built in. And that's what this is. Now, if you do have a lens with stabilization in that, you can activate that from these cameras so you're not completely without image stabilization if you need it. All cameras can record in log. The S1H and BS1H both do full V-log with 14 plus stops of dynamic range, while the BGH1 is V-log L with 13 stops. All cameras record to MOV or MP4. The S1H can actually do AVCHD as well. And to my knowledge, and by all means, if I'm wrong here, someone tell me in the comments below, but the only time that's really used is for long form recording of things like a school play, a theater event where you just need the camera in one place recording one really long file. Tell me if I'm wrong, please. All three cameras have unlimited recording time. And now let's get into the details of what they can shoot. At 422 10-bit, so that is, of course, your highest internal quality possible, you're able to shoot C4K and 4K up to 2997 frames per second. And in full HD, you can record up to 5994. If you drop down to 420 10-bit, then you can shoot in 6K. And of course, this is where the S1H has really shined. And now the BS1H does the same thing. 6K recording in a 3-2 aspect ratio with a full frame sensor. It's amazing. And you can do this at 24 and at 2398. You can also shoot in 5.4K at the same 3-2 aspect ratio up to 2997, and 5.9K at 16 by 9 aspect ratio, also up to 2997. If you want to shoot 60p, you'll need to crop into the sensor a little bit to shoot it in Super 35 mode. If you're shooting anamorphic, all three cameras are essentially the same, allowing you to shoot up to 2997 in 4K at 422 10-bit. However, the smaller sensor BGH1 will actually allow you to do 60p in 4K 420 8-bit for anamorphic mode. For VFR, or variable frame rate, that's for shooting slow motion, the cameras are virtually identical. However, the BGH1 actually can do up to 240 frames per second when shooting in 1080p. The full frame cameras can go up to 180 frames per second in full HD or up to 60 FPS in 4K and C4K. HFR or high frame rate is unique to the full frame cameras. And the difference between VFR and HFR is pretty straightforward. In VFR mode, if you're shooting, let's say, in 60 frames per second on a 30 frame clip, then those 60 frames get mapped out to 60 frames in the clip, meaning that 60 frames captured over one second becomes two seconds at 30 frames per second in the camera. And you can see that slow motion playback in camera. What you don't get with VFR mode, though, is audio. When you're shooting VFR, it's silent. HFR mode, however, allows you to capture the audio with it and is simply capturing the clip at a higher frame rate, up to 120 frames per second. So you still have your audio, but you're not going to see that slow down playback in camera. Of course, once you get it onto the timeline, there you can slow it down. And now for raw output. Not only does the S1H and BS1H output raw to the Atomos Ninja 5, just like the BGH1, but the S1H family will also output raw to the Blackmagic, meaning that you can record to ProRes on the Atomos or to be raw on the Blackmagic device. But there's one more thing about these. Remember, the Lumix S1H isn't just doing 4K, it's doing 5.9K raw output. Nearly 6K from this tiny little box camera when paired with an Atomos Ninja 5 or 5 Plus, or the Blackmagic recorder. All three cameras have cooling fans built in, and they have similar photo styles. Cine like D2 and V2, like 709, Vlog or Vlog L, depending on the camera, and for HLG, there's Leica 2100 HLG on the BS1H and S1H with hybrid log gamma on the BGH1. I honestly don't really understand the difference between those two. So if that's something that you really want to know, let me know in the comments and I'll do a video on that. I'll have to figure it out myself, but I'll do that for you. Just let me know in the comments and be sure you subscribe so you know when that video comes out. All cameras can work in shutter speed or shutter angle, and all cameras have a tally light. Now we get into some of the unique properties of the box cameras themselves. The first one up is Genlock, which we already talked about. So you have that Genlock input on both the BGH1 and the BS1H. Then you have dedicated timecode in and out ports on both the box cameras. And you actually do have timecode input on the BS1H, but it requires an adapter that plugs into the PC port. So it's not a dedicated BNC connector as it is on the box cameras. All cameras have a 2.5 millimeter remote socket. However, the control protocol in the BS1H and the BGH1 are considered general use. This is the standard protocol that you'll find on lots of other cameras, whereas the Lumix S1H and most other Lumix cameras have their own Panasonic protocol. All three cameras have type A HDMI ports. Along with HDMI, both box cameras have the SDI output and HDMI and SDI are both outputting simultaneously. 
you can choose in the camera's menu whether you want your menu and information system to be displayed on the HDMI out or on the SDI out, meaning that you can be capturing a clean feed on the HDMI out while simultaneously seeing a feed with the data overlays on the SDI out. All cameras have USB inputs as well. However, the USB input on the Lumix S1H is actually a PD port or a power delivery port, meaning that you can power and charge the camera over the USB port. Now, the box cameras don't have power delivery over USB, but as you'll see in a moment, there are multiple other ways to power these cameras. Next up, everything here is the same. They both have the dual card slots, microphone and headphone sockets, and they're all compatible with the XLR1. So if you want to add XLR inputs to your camera, the XLR1 will work with all three of them. All three cameras have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and then we get to the Ethernet connection. And this is one of the coolest things about this camera. And I gotta tell you, once you've used a camera with Ethernet, you're gonna wish that all of your cameras had Ethernet. If you're working in a studio environment, the ability to not only connect your camera to the network, but control it over the network up to 12 cameras at once from one location. That's not just changing the settings, but it's even seeing what the camera is seeing. It's absolutely remarkable. And again, I will be doing a video about that setup coming up pretty soon here. So again, be sure you subscribe so you don't miss that one. Both box cameras also feature wired RTP and RTSP streaming. Now this isn't for streaming directly to Facebook or YouTube. This is for streaming on an internal network. Think of it like a really, really long SDI cable. You can send 4K, very, very high quality video anywhere on a local network from this camera. It can get picked up on the other end anywhere else on the network by some receiving software or hardware that will allow you to get that clean feed anywhere. And finally, tether control. You can control the Lumix S1H with the Lumix tether software, but with the box cameras, you have Lumix tether for multicam, which allows you to control up to 12 cameras at once. All right, let's take a look at a little bit of sample footage. I didn't quite get to take the camera to like the streets of Seoul, which is what I really wanted to do because, you know, the environment being what it is, but I did shoot some stuff in my hometown the other day and uh, we'll take a look at that now. And when we come back, I'm gonna have this thing mounted up into the rig here and we'll show you what it looks like when it's all put together as you might actually use it for shooting. Here we have it. This is my BS1H all mounted up in this cage. And this is how I like to configure it for handheld shooting. Now, this is one of the beauties of a camera like this. You can truly set it up however you want to. So I'll just show you how I've got mine configured, but you might do yours totally differently. Mine starts with the small rig cage. And while you don't necessarily need a cage, because as you saw, the camera has a lot of mounting points on it, I like to have the cage on there as it just gives me more options like a place to put the handle and the follow focus rig and it keeps everything really, really sturdy. But if you wanted to, you could just mount a monitor directly to the top of the camera and off you go. So the cage gives me some options like to have this handle on here. So you can see the handle that's attached here. It's not exactly the handle that's made for this cage and there are some newer versions of this handle that work better. There's actually one that telescopes and makes room for the XLR1 if you wanna put that on there. So I don't have that one yet. I'll have to add that on here, but it's a handle. On top of the handle, I have my Ninja 5. And the Ninja is actually in an Andy Cine cage. This isn't necessary, but it does give me a couple of options that I really like. First of all, there is a clamp here to hold on to that HDMI port to make sure that it can't get pulled out. So that works really well with this beautiful purple Gerald Undone HDMI cable. Well done, buddy. These are pretty slick. And then over here on this side, I've got the controller for the follow focus system mounted to the cage that the Ninja 5 is in. Now that can get mounted anywhere. I think a lot of people actually mount it on the right-hand side. I just like it here on the left, but that's the beauty of it. You can configure it however you like. And this is cool because it's removable so I can easily take this off if I want to have the control separately. Inside of this, of course, is the Ninja 5 monitor. And on the back of the monitor here, you'll see that I've got the Angelbird Atom X SSD. I also have a battery here on the Ninja itself, but you'll see in a moment that I could be powering it from the battery that's powering the camera. We'll talk about that in a moment here. Over on the bottom, you'll see that I have the rest of the follow focus system. That's the gear that is controlled by the knob up top, allowing me to focus the lens on there. And if we swing it around to the back, you'll see the battery that's here. Now this is a SWIT battery. What I really like about this battery is that it has two additional ports. This port is currently being used to power 
the follow focus system. However, it could be used to power the Ninja 5 itself. And then I could use the USB port on the bottom here to power the follow focus. However, I'm doing it this way because the Ninja does take quite a bit of power from that battery. And if I have that battery on there, it'll deplete pretty quickly. And I only have one of these SWIT batteries. So what I tend to do is use the SWIT battery for the camera and for the follow focus, and then just put a dedicated battery on the Ninja. But if you have multiple SWITs, then you could certainly go that way. That works too. Finally, let's look at the lens. I've got the Freewell magnetic filter system on here. I did a video on that recently. You should definitely check that out if you haven't seen it. And as you can see, I've got in here one of my favorite vintage lenses, the Super Tacomar 50 millimeter F1.4. I just love the look of this lens. Now this is a obviously all manual M42 screw mount lens, which means it has to be adapted to L mount, but that's the beauty of L mount. You can adapt just about anything to it. And I'm using on here a simple Fotasi M42 to L mount adapter. The follow focus gears on here are 3D printed by followfocusgears.com. Again, I'll put a link to them down below as well. They print out gears for just about any lens that you can imagine, and that fits perfectly on the lens, giving me meticulous control with this follow focus system. And that's the rig. That's the whole thing. Again, this is the beauty of a camera like this. You don't have to put it into a rig. In fact, you could take most of this off, just about everything except for the battery and the lens, and put it on a gimbal or put it on a drone. There's really unlimited possibilities of what you can do with a small camera like this. Maybe put it on a PTZ head. I mean, there's tons of things you can do with it. Mount it in the rafters, like I've got one up there. They're just all over the place. Anyway, you can do so much with a box camera, things that you wouldn't normally think that you would do with a regular camera, especially with that network control. So whether you're looking at the BS1H or the BGH1, the box cameras are definitely something worth checking out. And of course, once again, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out when I do that big video on the BGH1s and you'll learn how I'm using them in my studio here. Thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, do all those good things, and I will see you in the next video.